My name is Crooksy. I'm the family's pastor here at Rehope. Uh, our senior pastor, Brian, who normally does the teaching here, is over at our campus in Belfast teaching um, this weekend, so I get the chance uh, to talk to you. We're not really in a series right now. Um, we're just kind of speaking about things that maybe we've been thinking about recently. Whenever I get a chance to like choose whatever you're going to teach on, I kind of I kind of generally just go, "What's been my favourite Bible read-through share recently?" and then go off that. So I'm going to be speaking about something today. But let me tell you a little story first. Um, things you need to know before this. Um, I used to be a primary school teacher, and the story goes that on the fourth of December, 2012. I lost my job in the school that I was teaching in, and I remember the date. Like, you're going to remember the date of the day that you lost your job that close to Christmas. Although, full disclosure, I remember it because it's Jay-Z's birthday. (laughs) You're going to remember the date. And it was a clerical error. Like, it was an admin error that cost me my job. I had phoned the General Teachers Council the summer before and asked them what I needed to do to renew my registration and they said your registration will automatically renew with us and your registration fee will automatically be taken out of your pay packet. You don't need to do anything. Cool. Great. Usually that is true but if it's the end of your probation year, which it was, that does not apply. So unknown to me, I had been working in a school from August until December without any legal protection, without any insurance, without being registered as a teacher, and you simply cannot do that. It was like 1130 AM, and we were in the assembly hall, like all the kids from the infant department, all the staff, support staff, and we were practicing for the nativity play. And the head teacher walked in and called me out of the room for a moment and told me the deal. You will not, as of right this moment, be working here anymore. So I drove to Edinburgh and begged the General Teachers Council that if there was anything that they could do, and if there was anything that I could do, oh my goodness, I will lie down in the traffic if there is anything that we can do. This wasn't my fault. You guys told me this. It wasn't negligence. I didn't know. If I hadn't known, I would have done something. Can you do anything? And the answer was no. The the deal is done. There's nothing we can do. So I drove home in the rush hour and got home, I don't know, just after five and was sitting on the stairs in our old flat in Mary Hill when my wife Jamie got home from work and I'm sitting there with my head in my hands and then I explained to her that 21 days before Christmas I have lost my job. We've been married like six months. This wasn't amazing. (laughs) It wasn't amazing. I know what disappointment feels like. I'm not a stranger to it, and I know that some of you have lived through seasons of disappointment in your lives, and maybe some of you will be living through that right now, and I know what it feels like, and you know what it feels like, and it's rough, and it happens, and it's rough, but since it happens, we're going to need to think about how we can navigate those times in our life when we experience disappointment crises. So we're going to look at the example of how Moses did it in Numbers chapter 27. So if you've got a Bible with you today, uh, why don't you go ahead and look that up. We are going to start reading Numbers 27 at verse 12, but if you don't have a Bible with you this evening, that is, that is no problem at all. Any scripture that I read or refer to will be on the screen at the appropriate moment, and you can follow along there. Numbers 27 Verse 12 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain of the Abarim range and see the land 
that I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you will also be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother, was. When the community quarreled in the wilderness of Zin, both of you rebelled against my command to show my holiness in their sight at the waters. Those were the waters of Meribah, of Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. So some context for this section of the events is that God called Moses to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt and into a land that he had promised them. And Moses did not want to do that. He didn't feel ready, and when God called him, he didn't want to do it. He didn't feel ready, and as Brian talked to us about last week, I mean, it's quite common when God calls people that they don't feel ready. Moses didn't want to do it, but he did it. And the job quickly became way more than that initial job description. Not only was he placed as a leader to the people guiding and instructing them, it's not just the geographical journey to the land God would give them, but also he became their spiritual leader. He taught them how to worship, obey, and love God. He became their political and diplomatic leader, playing his part in maintaining the social order of the community and negotiating, for example, um, right of passage through other territories and nations on their journey. He became their judicial leader, acting and judging and magistrating for the people in their disputes and in, in cases of inheritance. And he became their military leader. He planned and he strategized for various battles against nations that they came up against. This was a big, this was a big job. And right at the start, it was a big job and it only got harder. And right at the start, he didn't want to do it. And then it only got harder. And it would be a big job and it would be a hard job even if everything went according to plan, but it didn't. And the people rejected Moses and his leadership. They rejected God's plans being implemented through Moses countless times. Their journey was 40 years longer than it needed to be. It was disappointment after disappointment after frustration after frustration until things kind of came to a head ahead at the waters of Meribah of Kadesh when the people demanded water and God said he would provide. We can find these events in Numbers chapter 20 uh, starting at verse 7 which says the Lord spoke to Moses says take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch and it will yield its water. You'll bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock for you? And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff so that a great amount of water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and he showed his holiness to them. Forty odd years of frustration and disappointment from a job he didn't even want. It took their toll on Moses and he reached a breaking point and he did something that was kind of like what God asked him to do, but not quite. And sometimes it's the difference between doing exactly what God asks you to do and something that's kind of like what God asks you to do that can make a really big difference. Like Moses took credit for the water. Must we bring water out of a rock for you? 
And sometimes this subtle difference in practice demonstrates a big difference in attitude that we have. And that subtle difference in practice and that big difference in attitude puts a hindrance on the impact that God wants to have for good. And in this case, we can see that, but we can see more that not only is the good impacted, but there's also really drastic negative consequences for Moses and Aaron, which brings us back to chapter 27. Go look at the land, and then you will die. Go and look at the fruit of your life's work that you will be so agonizingly close to, but that you will never get to enjoy, and then you can die. You guys, our actions have consequences, and when we follow God, those consequences will be a blessing to him and to us and to the people that we share our world with. But when we sin, we can bring disappointment and difficulty on ourselves and on the people that we share our lives with. And that's just kind of how life works sometimes. It was Moses' own sin that brought this on him. And that's not always the way it is. Sometimes it's other people's actions and other people's sins that bring disappointment into your life. But in this case, Moses brought these consequences on himself. When I lost my job at the end of 2012, it was through a miscommunication and a clerical admin error. But there's an important detail that is also in this story. So in my disappointment and in my hurt, I wanted answers from the GTC. Like how come it was six months later that you're telling me about this? How come you didn't tell me sooner? I would have done something. They knew what school I worked in. They knew my email address. They knew my phone number. How come I'm finding out about this whenever it's already too late? I would have done something. And I wanted answers. But the important detail is that I had moved house twice actually, since I gave any details to the GTC, they have been writing me letters, multiple letters, saying this is your deal, and if you don't fix it, this is what is going to happen, but it's easily fixed. All you need to do is this. Letter after letter. I didn't get him. Return to sender. You've lost your job. And I knew then, and I knew now, and as much as I didn't really want to think about it then, and sometimes <laughs> I still really don't want to think about it, that I, like, I want to put it down to an admin error. And I want to put it down to, you should have told me. But I knew then, and I know now, that my actions played a part in that overall narrative that resulted in me losing my job. I should have been responsible and updated my details with them. there were consequences for me not doing that. I lost my job. I not only lost my job, but I was at the school on supply, so that meant I needed to apply to get back on the supply list with Glasgow City Council. I needed to apply to be re-registered with the, or, or registered in the first place with the GTC, and I also needed to go through all the like security, PVG, like child security checks at teachers, need to do, and I needed to do all of that over the Christmas break when everybody who works there is on holiday. And it cost me two months of work, and it cost me two months of pay, and there were consequences. It cost me, not just me, it cost Jamie, who, for the record, 
was incredibly patient and supportive through all of it despite her own worries and her own disappointments in those months and I know that there's something I could have done to stop that from happening and we think about disappointments and prevention is better than cure right like you want to avoid as much as you can and clearly we're not going to be able to avoid all the disappointment and all the hurt in our lives but if there is something that you could do to avoid disappointment and hurt doesn't it make sense that we would go to those lengths to do it you're not going to avoid them all but making sure your heart is in line with God's and making sure that you're not walking into sin and bringing negative consequences on yourself will be helpful and being in a lifestyle of God give me your heart for this so that you're not walking into sin when our hearts are in line with God's we will be doing his will we will be pursuing holiness and that will mean being in a lifestyle of confessing and repenting of our sins and asking God to highlight and show us areas where he wants us to make adjustments in our attitudes and in our thoughts and in our actions and that will be good and that will mean we'll walk with him and that will mean positive consequences in our lives and although that won't mean the end of all of our hurt and disappointment it will contribute to us avoiding some of the self-inflicted ones and this is complicated I get it I'm not saying that all you need to do is be good and your life will be rosy because we've talked recently at this church about unanswered prayer and that bringing her in disappointment about waiting on God and that may be meaning hurt and disappointment and God bringing trials and tests in our lives to strengthen us and train us and that may be bringing hurt and disappointment there are plenty of reasons why these things might happen I'm not saying just be good and your life will be great but I am saying walk with God remain in him and see positive fruit in your life John 15 shoot for that rather than self-inflicted disappointment that makes sense to me because I mean Moses didn't really have the luxury of avoiding this disappointment we can't avoid it all so we want to be ready for it when it does come so let's look at how Moses deals with his disappointment and we're going to pick up reading chapter 27 again this time in verse 15 so Moses appealed to the Lord may the Lord the God of the spirits of all flesh appoint a man over the community who will go out before them and come back in before them who will bring them out and bring them in so that the Lord's community won't be like sheep without a shepherd how do you react to disappointment do you drive to Edinburgh to tell the GTCS that you don't deserve this and this is not your fault or do you demand answers and talk about people behind their backs and try to shift blame even though the deal is done and there's nothing that can be done about this and you're not achieving anything by that do you recluse and not leave your house and listen to a bunch of Taylor Swift and binge eat leftover lasagna in front of homes under the hammer because I did that too and those are all like pretty human reactions I maybe wouldn't recommend them but they're pretty human reactions and if you have reacted in these ways by saying this isn't my fault I don't deserve this by trying to shift the blame onto somebody else or by withdrawing from your problems if you have reacted in those ways I get it I reacted in those ways and I would have grace for you I probably wouldn't recommend those ways but I'd have grace for you but look at Moses man this isn't a human reaction is it he is unbelievable dude could have said God I don't even want this job you made me do it and guess what 
I did it. And then I did one thing. Like one thing and you're telling me this, that it's over after one thing. 40 years and then one thing. But he didn't. He didn't react like that. He accepted his faith. He recognized that God is God. And God is God over all people. He accepted and he reacted with humility. I guess Moses found out right after the water came from the rock what his fate would be. And he did have time in the intervening seven chapters to come to terms with his fate and get to grips with it before he responded. I don't think that that negates or diminishes his reaction in any way he is so humble he accepts it he submits and he shows that he is humble through his reaction and i know what it's like to be disappointed and i know what it's like to not respond with humility and i know that that seems impossibly hard sometimes i'm under no illusions that this is easy So how are we going to do this? How are we going to get into that place where we can respond humbly? Well, Moses is going to be able to look back on his life and all the disappointments that he has walked through, and he is going to be able to see how they have prepared him for this moment. When you are experiencing disappointment, think back to how you've dealt with it in the past. Consider your preparation. What has given you the skills and the attitude that you need to walk through this moment? How has God been preparing you for what's to come through what has gone before? What was helpful and fruitful and what would you want to do again and what was unhelpful and damaging and what do you want to make sure that you don't repeat? When you're dealing with disappointment, it's helpful to step outside of yourself. It's so easy to retreat into self-pity like I did. But in these events, we see Moses thinking about the people ahead of himself. He's the kind of leader who knows what is necessary for those people, and he puts them first. When you experience disappointment, think about what impact it's going to have on the other people around you. Like I thought, and I could see what impact my disappointment was having on Jamie. Think about what you can do to help them cope in that moment and walk through it. And being humble and thinking about others shows that caring attitude that we are aiming to grow and to foster in our church. And it helps us to step back and see the world through a wider lens. And it helps us to consider the big picture. Because so much of our disappointment starts with us, right? It's our hopes, our aspirations, our expectations of what our life would be like. By the stage, I thought that I would have a steady career. Or by the stage, I thought I would be on the property ladder. Or I wanted to go to this uni, but now I have to go here. Or I wanted to live in this city, but I didn't get that job, so I can't move. Or I wanted to be more active, or I want to eat better, or whatever. Like By this stage, I thought I'd be living in a land flowing with milk and honey for like 40 years already. And now you're telling me no. It's really easy to build up our expectations and our aspirations. Sometimes we don't even notice it. Like you scroll Instagram for like a moment and you see so many people who appear, keyword, appear to have their lives on track way better than you and it's all like hashtag blessed and you're like, Disappointed, like they are setting your aspirations for you. They look like they're doing the things 
they look like they have the things and you want to do the things and you want to have the things and they're doing that and you're not and they're a hashtag humble brag and you're like my life disappointment crises moments happen in our lives but I think in this day and age we live with a background level of disappointment where we are constantly reminded by other people who are maybe setting our goals for us and then we cannot hit them but everybody else that you look at is and we have this background level of disappointment where we're just disappointed all the time because we're constantly reminded how we're not achieving what we want to or we're not meeting our expectations Moses sees the big picture. He sees what God has for him. He sees what God has for the people. And he knows that everybody else who is alive in that community will get to live in that country except him. Everyone else except him. But he sees the big picture. And that gives him a higher perspective. And when you think about your expectations and your aspirations, offer them to God. God, give me your heart for this. Give me your heart for my aspirations and my expectations. What do you think about this? What are your expectations for me? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Help me see your big picture. Moses has the big picture. He knows the people he's leading and he knows that they need a leader and without one, they would be lost like sheep without a shepherd. And even with such an amazing leader as Moses, because he was, those people have had a turbulent experience of walking in obedience to God. They have had extreme highs. They have had extreme lows. And Moses acts out of love for those people, which when you think about it, is absolutely crazy. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to think about how Moses might resent those people. We'll hear their words from chapter 20, verses 2 to 5. says, there is no water for the community. So they assembled against Moses and Aaron and the people quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Like why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you led us up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's not a place of grain, figs, vines, and pomegranates. And there's no water for us to drink. We'd rather die, Moses. And it's your fault. We'd rather be dead. I'd rather be a slave with a pomegranate than be here with you. And then you act out of love towards those people? Are you kidding me? On a human level, it would be understandable. Not recommended but understandable if Moses resented those people and saw them as the catalyst for the events that led to him experiencing the biggest disappointment of his life. But that is not what happens. Moses knows them. He cares about them and he loves them. That much is clear from his reaction that in the moment of his biggest disappointment, Moses asks God to help those people. Rather than expressing any loss or grief or asking God to change his mind or showing any bitterness whatsoever towards those people, his humility is outrageous. Surely this can't be a human reaction. If you're going through a season of disappointment right now, if you're experiencing pain and hurt 
or if you have gone through that time in the past and you still feel some pain in your heart when you think about that or when you think about the person who caused it and you know that there's still something in there and that you couldn't honestly say that you 100% act out of love for them because there's still that hurt hand that over to God and forgive pray God I still feel the hurt because of that disappointment because of what happened to me and I want to forgive this person for that thing that they did I want to forgive them I do forgive them God bless them and release us from this hurt Moses reaction is amazing listen to these words from Numbers 12 Moses was a humble man no kidding more humble than any man on the face of the earth most humble person on earth but a person demonstrating that people can react like this sometimes we build up biblical heroes and we're like they were able to do that but I'll never be able to do that James writes about that in, in chapter 5 of his letter to the churches saying Elijah was a person just like you and he prayed that there wouldn't be any rain for three years and there wasn't and then he prayed that it would rain and it did a person just like you people can react like this this is a human reaction amazing though his levels of humility are huge so let's copy him <laughs> let's do it like he did it let's consider our preparation let's step outside of ourselves let's consider the big picture and let's act out of love as we seek to walk through seasons of disappointment when Moses requests a new leader for the people he foreshadows and foreshadows like crazy how the people will need a leader of such humility as Moses had they will need the most humble person on the face of the earth and Moses asks for someone who will go in and come out before them and be their shepherd mark 6 so as Jesus stepped ashore he saw a huge crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. John 10, I'm the door. If anyone, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance I'm the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and I mean Moses is amazing truly amazing but Jesus is better and Moses knew the way that the people needed to be provided for in that moment and in the coming years but the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus, the most humble person ever to walk on the face of this earth ever, knows what you need in any season, in any time. He knows. He took on more disappointment and more hurt than we can ever know he gets you he gets it and he gets you you can cast your disappointments on Jesus because if Moses was humble then Jesus was humbler and if Moses was prepared for what was to come then Jesus was more prepared and if Moses stepped outside of himself to think of others in love how much more did Jesus do that 
And if Moses was aware that part of the consequences for sin is hurt and pain, how much more does Jesus know what that is like? And they weren't even his sins. They were mine. And they were yours. And he gets us and he gets it. He understands. If you're feeling weighed down by disappointment, I assure you, you are not alone. You're not. And if you are tired and worn out by hurt, can I assure you, you are not alone. Matthew chapter 9, 36 says this, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Go to Jesus, go to him. Receive his compassion. Compassion being he understands what you're going through plus he wants to do something about it. Receive his compassion, knowing that Jesus understands he has been there, knowing that he feels your hurt, your pain, your disappointment, your sadness, and that he wants to help. Go to him. I've got a few challenges for you this evening. The first one is about preparation. Um, I want you to think back on a season of disappointment that you've walked through and write down, like make a list of the ways that God helped you through that and thank him for that help. Reflect on the lessons that you've learned, like write down the things that were helpful and that you'd want to do again and write down the things that weren't helpful and were damaging and ask God to protect you from those mistakes and repeating them as you walk through this season. The second one is about stepping outside of yourself. And this is for people, um, maybe for people who aren't walking through a season of disappointment right now. But if you know someone who is, I want you to reach out to them this week and show them some practical kindness. Like, hang out grab a coffee or a pint or take them over some dinner, hang out, have a chat, I, my ears are open. And offer to pray with them. And if they say they would like you to pray for them, then great. And if they say no thanks, then okay, you haven't lost anything. But offer, offer to pray for them. The third one is about acting out of love. And if you know that there's someone that you still have some lingering hurt or maybe some lingering unforgiveness or bitterness towards them because of something that they have done to you that resulted in a bunch of disappointment in your life, if you can identify that person, be brave and be obedient and work through a process to forgive them. Sometimes you just say, I forgive you, or God, I forgive this person and the deal is done and sometimes you have to work through it and repeat and reconfirm I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them even though you're still hurting and when you've done that if appropriate I'm serious, if appropriate reach out to them and see if you can restore that relationship you will know depending on how much hurt you're feeling right now, if that is appropriate. Or you will know based on maybe the severity of the thing that they had done, whether that is appropriate. And I'm convinced that you can forgive someone, completely forgive someone, and simultaneously hope to never see them again in your life. If appropriate, think about that, pray about that, make a sensible choice on that but restoring a relationship would be so awesome.